Hello, everyone, and welcome to lecture 10 in our ongoing series about Middle Egyptian and hieroglyphics. Uh, today, we'll be covering time, names, and more, all found in chapters 5 and 6 of Hoke's Book of Egyptian Grammar. We're covering pretty much everything other than the infinitive in chapters 5 and 6. Uh, we're not going to go over a couple of things like units of measure that are just vocabulary items that don't contain any real special grammar stuff, because quite frankly, this isn't really designed to be a tutorial of vocabulary. Uh, you should just be learning that on your own through your use of the book. Uh, but we are going to go over everything else uh, that's covered in those chapters. Most notably, the royal names, dates and times, and some points of grammar. If you know anything about Egyptian royal names. In fact, if you know anything about hieroglyphics at all, you're probably aware of cartouches. The way you might have learned about cartouches is that it, how, it is how names were written in Egyptian, or perhaps just how the names of certain royal personages were written. Turns out the situation is a little bit more complicated. Cartouches are not the be-all and end-all of names. Uh, in fact, most people would never use them. They would just spell out their name, more or less as you'd expect, you know, as you and I do, just phonetically. Kings had it a little tougher. They had five names. And two of them had cartouches, and another one had another different container. This complicated naming system developed over the course of the early dynastic period and the Old Kingdom. Originally, as Egypt was being united, kings only had one name. Uh, if you look at the records of kings in the first dynasty and kings of the late pre-dynastic period, kings like Narmer, the guy who united Egypt, they're only ever shown with one of their names, their Horus name. But this got more complicated. By the time of the fourth dynasty, when the customs of Egyptian kingship had been really fully established, they had gone up to five names, and that number would remain constant down to the Ptolemaic period, the last people to really make use of Egyptian pharaohship as a concept. The Roman emperors did a little, but it wasn't really the same. Uh, it, also, the names were much more often a political statement rather than being actually about uh, you know, the, the birth name of the king. The birth name was used as one of these names, and which name it was varied, and where it, where it fit in varied. There's a lot of debate about that, but most of these names are about what the king intends to do, how they view the world, uh, what their agenda is as a king, that kind of thing. The first name in the order that they show up when all five are presented, which by the way isn't super common, usually you'll only see the last two, but sometimes all five get presented, as well as the first one to be developed chronologically, is the Horus name. And we call it the Horus name because it's always preceded by a picture of Horus, or almost always at least, there are a few exceptions. And it is always contained within a container called a Serech, which, my apologies, is not on the next slide. Um, I consolidated where I was putting the examples while I was making this, so the example will be after we've gone through all the names, I'm gonna show you the full name of a king. Uh, I'm not going to say who it is yet, because I want to, <laughs> I want you to test your knowledge of Egyptian history by seeing if you can figure it out from reading it. But anyways, a serac is this sort of square container with little lines trailing off. It almost looks like a banner. That might be what it's trying to evoke. Originally, it might have been a birth name, because kings like Narmer and Den use their Horus name with the serac very, very often. Uh, later on, it became a way of stating a political agenda. Also, in case you're wondering why it's Horus, specifically, remember that the king was viewed as being Horus incarnate. That was the theological justification for kingship, that the pharaoh was the god Horus. Uh, that's why Horus was picked for this name, and he also actually shows up in another one of the king's names that we'll see shortly. Then you have the two ladies' name. This one also appeared in the first dynasty. Uh, it's also called the Nebti name. If you remember, uh, T-Y is the ending for the female duel. So Neb, Lord, Nebti, 
two female lords, or two ladies, more appropriately. The two ladies in question are Nekbet and Wajet. Uh, they are the vulture protector goddess of Upper Egypt and the snake protector goddess of Lower Egypt. It signifies the divine rulership over both of those countries. Remember that in Egyptian thinking, even though there was only ever one pharaoh, or only ever supposed to be one pharaoh, ruled over both of them, Egypt was always two countries. Upper Egypt, the narrow, long south of the country, and Lower Egypt, the wide delta. And this was the union of those two in a single name, the union of the two ladies in a single hieroglyph. Sometimes, especially during the Middle Kingdom, it was identical to the Horus name, but it could also be its own name. There was no rule about that. Just a matter of whether the king really wanted to emphasize something or vary it up, have different names. Then you have the Golden Horus name. Uh, no one really knows what the Golden Horus name is about. Uh, it might be about Horus defeating Seth. That might be the symbolism here, because Seth is believed to come from foreign countries, which is also where you get gold and whole thing with that, uh, we don't really know. It's the third name, it's the one that gets talked about the least, because there's still a lot of debate about it, unfortunately. Then we get to the fun stuff. The fourth name is called the Nesubiti name, or more commonly, the Praenomen. Uh, Praenomen is a Latin term, by the way. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to know precisely what it means in Latin, but it, it was adopted very early on in the history of Egyptology for this name, and that's what it's used. I personally think that throne name is the most appropriate name, or perhaps even a, almost epithet or a title. It is the most commonly used of the king's name. Uh, if you're referring to the king in a letter or something like that, you're going to call him by his Nesubiti name, Certainly, certainly true in the New Kingdom. We have a lot of correspondence in the time of the New Kingdom. Um, there's a whole bunch you can learn about that. I actually highly recommend learning about like the Amarna letters and diplomacy during the 18th dynasty and that kind of thing. But the kings are always addressed by their throne name. So I want to say it was Amenhotep III who is Neb Maatre was his throne name. And so they call him Neb Maatre, or they call him what it sounded like in late Egyptian, which is Nimuria. Uh, in all the letters. So it's the throne name that gets used. This is one of the two names that gets a cartouche surrounding it. Uh, and it also almost always, as a rule, contains Ra. This is something that goes back to the solar cult that appeared in like roughly the late fourth, early fifth dynasty of the Old Kingdom. And it just kind of became traditional and really strongly stuck around. You, you'll see Ra at least once in most throne names. Another one I can think of off the top of my head is Ramses II, uh, who was Usur Matre Setepenre, uh, which is something like powerful is the justice of Ray chosen by Ray. Always, always, always about the sun god. It is preceded by another dual symbol. A sedge plant, which is you know kind of reed, the, the sort of thing you'd see growing in a swamp and a bee. Now, it could just mean the man of Upper and Lower Egypt. Uh, you know, Nesu is Upper Egypt and the bee, the BT, the symbol of Lower Egypt. But the symbolism might be somewhat deeper than that. And I actually personally subscribe to that rather strongly. Uh, you see, Nesu is not just a symbol of Upper Egypt. It's also a reference to the institution of kingship and the divine nature of kingship. If you have, for example, a royal granary, that would be the Nesu granary. Not Nesu Biti, just Nesu. Biti, on the other hand, would sometimes be used to refer to the king, the physical person, the human being who occupies this divine eternal office. The Biti is the temporary occupant, the Nesu, the eternal unchanging reality of Ma, the great king who rules. So, 
you could almost translate it, and I really like to take it as this if I'm going for a more poetic thing, as the king above and below, as in the divine king and the human king. Both of them combined into this one name, the praenomen, the most important of the royal names. But this was not the personal name of the king. Certainly it wasn't by the fourth dynasty. There may have been a short period where the personal name was used here, but pretty much as a rule it's not. And again, I say may have been, because if it was, it falls into the very murky period between the first and third dynasties, when the name was in a bit of flux. A lot about the institutions of kingship were in a bit of a flux. So that is something for people who are well beyond me in understanding of the early old kingdom and the early dynastic period. The personal name went in the son of Ra name, or the nomen slot. This was also in a cartouche. It is always preceded by the words son of Ra, Sa Re. That's an easy enough thing to translate that I didn't bother uh, writing it out in the Egyptian, uh, similar to the Golden Horse, and unlike Nebti and Nesubiti names. Um, it contained the pharaoh's birth name. In later periods, by later I mean like the 19th and 20th dynasties and the late period, I think it kind of gets embellished. It is possible that the extraordinarily long nomens of these rulers were their birth names, but I suspect that they were additional epithets so the king could put even more symbolism into his name. This was the last part added during the fourth dynasty, and from that point on it was consistently the birth name, and the name that it would make the most sense to refer to a king by in historical writing. This is in part because there are four kings named Tutmos, for example, but those you can just say Tutmos, the first, second, third, fourth, they all had very slightly different praenomens. You couldn't make them Neb Matre the first, Neb Matre the second, because you have, you know, you might have Neb Matre and then Nebu Matre and things like that. It would be impossible to remember effectively, so we simply use the nomens to remember the kings by. Here is an example. King of the 12th dynasty, uh, you know, middle, middle kingdom. So let's go through the whole name. First you have the Horus name, and you can recognize it in the Serac. And if you read out the signs, that spells Ankh Mesut, which is roughly something like born in life or created in life. Um, Unfortunately, I, I put this together a couple of days ago. I no longer remember precisely what it is. Uh, but that's the, the general sense of it. Uh, and then that name repeats for the Nebti name and the Golden Horus name. And this is pretty typical for a ruler of the Middle Kingdom to do. Less common in the New Kingdom. And then we have the Nesubiti name, which unfortunately the Nesubiti, uh, it must have gotten removed or not gotten typed in properly. Uh, but it is a, a, a sedge sign and a B sign. You can see good examples of it in your book, and it's surrounded by a cartouche, uh, and it is pepper carré. Pretty common way to put, do it. Uh, kind of a, a vague concept of something positive about Ra. Uh, the, what it means is the spirits or the ca the forms of Ra are given are in ka, his ka something something like that or the ka of ray is created it is it's an abstract thing because it requires you to fully understand what a ka is and also to know what is being meant by hefer which is a little ambiguous suffice it to say it's honoring ron talking about his power and then you have the sa ray um which is the the symbol for sun the duck and then there should be a ra symbol there but i think that also got removed jsesh can be a little fickle uh, JSESH being the software I used to generate these hieroglyphs that I then put here. And then, uh, reveal of what this is, Senwazret. This is Senwazret I, a monarch I consider to be grossly underrated. Uh, and also, this is some honorific transposition. Sen is at the back, because that's the least important part. Sen just means man. Or, well, Sa is man, N is man of, and then Wazret 
is a place and also a uh, deity. A little iffy. Senwazard is a, a, a somewhat misunderstood name, I think. On to the Egyptian numerical system. The Egyptians have a decimal number system. And yes, I do need to clarify that there are some human, and you know, not the computer ones like binary, octal, or hexadecimal, that do exist and did see use. Uh, most societies did use base 10 because they counted on their hands, but a few, like the Maya, used base 20 because they counted on their hands and their toes before they had to make another category, flip over. And the Babylonians, just to mess things up, used base 60. This is probably for mathematical convenience. Um, base 60 is pretty nice if you're doing a lot of division of things. We're not going to memorize the names of individual numbers. It's kind of, kind of pointless in learning ancient languages because it's pretty clear what they are. The Egyptians would like never write out the name of the number. They just mark it in their numerical system. You only need to know two because they come up quite a bit and then they show up in other words too. It's good to know. Wa means one. You can also show up in things like only uh, can be derived from wa, and two is sen, or senwi in the dual, uh, which is also the word for companion or brother, you know, your, your second. Numbers work on a sort of a tally mark system. Uh, you, have, you, you, you do lines until you reach a set total of them, 10. And then you create a new symbol for 10, and then you put down more tallies and 10. And then when you have 10 tens, you make another number. And then when you have 10 hundreds, you make another symbol, and so on and so forth. And you just list them out. You might have five hundreds, and then four 10 symbols, and three marks, three tallies, and you have 543. These are all the symbols. Um, you probably won't see a ton of the middle ones. So you've got your tally mark. And then you have your 10 is, it uh, looks like a little hill. It's almost two tally marks connected. That might be where it comes from. Uh, that's 10. 100 is a little curly cue. 1,000 is a lotus plant. 10,000 is a finger, uh, which I think does actually come up at some point, like a finger being a unit of measure for a myriad for 10,000. Uh, 100,000 is a frog. And one million, which is heh, dotted h, dotted h, is symbolized by the god, the god or goddess heh, uh, the deity of infinity. Because once you reach a million, you're functionally at infinity in the Egyptian numerical system if you're not trying to do large maths. And in fact, heh could just represent uncountable. There are too many of them to count which is perfectly fine for a million. If you encounter a million of something, you don't need to count them. There are just lots and lots, and you, you can stop at that. Uh, that's basically what it symbolizes. I always like to remember it, uh, that, he's, that Heck has thrown his hands up in the air because he has given up on counting. There are so many things. Now for the ordinal numbers, uh, the numbers you might use in, in rankings and that kind of thing. Uh, one is idiomatic. It's the adjective tepi, meaning first. Uh, this is common to the Afro-Asiatic language, or certainly to the Semitic languages, that for, for the word first, you use head. Uh, so for example, Rosh Hashanah uh, is the Jewish New Year, of course, and it means the head of the year. You don't say the first of the year, you say the head. And in the same way, the word tep changes to an adjective with a Y ending. We'll learn about that in a minute. means first. Two through nine is the number plus a nu added at the end. Second is senu. Third, we'd write three nu, etc. Uh, and then it just behaves as an adjective. Ten, you actually for ten or more, you actually use a prepositional phrase. You use mech, which means like filling up, and then the number. So like mech one hundred would mean it, you'd fill up a hundred. It's it's a little weird uh, in our usage, but it's um that's the Egyptian idiom. You just have to learn it. And all of these, the news and the mechs, can take T endings to make them agree with feminine nouns. Uh, they, there is no need to put a plural ending on, because if you're dealing with any of these other than one, it is obviously a plural. You don't have to specify a plural ending that would be redundant.
dates and times. The Egyptian calendar is actually pretty easy for us because it is a solar calendar and it is the one that inspired our modern day calendar. We have just been improving upon this calendar since the Egyptians invented it five millennia ago. Um, and th that is that is not me trying to uh, <laughs> argue for the virtues of Egyptian culture or anything like that. That is genuinely true. The Julian calendar came about when Julius Caesar, who at the time was as the Pontifex Maximus in charge of the badly damaged Roman calendar, traveled to Egypt, encountered their much more sensible calendar, thought up a little bit of an improvement to take into account leap years, and put it into place for the Roman Empire, which then, with a little bit more tweaking on the leap years, became a modern-day Gregorian calendar. The Egyptian year was divided into 12 months of exactly 30 days. Those of you paying attention at home will notice that you're missing five and a quarter days. Five days got tacked on to the end to make up for it. The Egyptians do not seem to have done anything about leap years, not to my knowledge. Uh, it is conceivable that they adjusted for it, but it's also conceivable that their calendar was just really badly off most of the time. We don't know. Uh, they divided the 360 regular days into three seasons of four months each. Flood, winter, and summer. Flood is also sometimes called inundation. Uh, they are in Egyptian Ahet, Peret, and Shemu. These months, by the way, uh, I believe they did have names. It doesn't get written a lot in official sources, but they have names in Coptic, the descendant language, and names that are obviously taken from ancient Egyptian. So the Egyptians did name their months, but the civil calendar used by the authorities didn't bother with that. They just wrote out the year, the season, the month number, and the date. So you would have year two, Winter 3, 8 would be the eighth day of the third month of winter in the second year. And the implication would be of the king, and then you say of the king so and so, because years were all relative to the king. So if a king died in his 18th year, his son's first year would overlap his 18th. They'd be the same year. One of the grammar points, probably the most important one in this section, is the Nisbi adjective. Nisba is the Arabic term, because in Arabic you would add an A ah ending at the end. But in Egyptian, you add a Y ending. Same concept. If you speak Arabic, it's a Nisba, but with a Y, skip this slide. If you don't speak Arabic, uh, it's just how you can turn either a preposition or a noun into an adjective. So if you wanted to say the local god, i.e. the god of this town, you would say Necher Muti. Necher, God, new, or Newt is the town with a Y ending, Muti, it becomes the local God. Uh, note that this doesn't actually have to be written with the Y symbol. You can also do a little trick where you use the dual, where you, you would just put the city symbol twice. If I remember correctly, uh, that is what Hoke uses to demonstrate this, actually, uh, is Necher and then two city symbols. Yes, that's correct. Nisbi can also be made from prepositions. Two of them are particularly important, imi and iri. Imi is that which is in, and iri is literally like that which is to, but it, it means connected to. And they always precede the noun. They, uh, they create kind of a separate meaning, but almost in it's still in a prepositional way. Uh, you can use eerie after a noun, but it's an adjective meaning it's or there. Uh, it's kind of unusual in that all the other ones, it goes before the noun. One final point of grammar is uh, what we might call the Egyptian ditto mark, sepsen. There really isn't a lot to it. It just means that the hieroglyph before, like the whole, or the word before really, is to be written a second time. So if you have nefer sepsen, that means nefer nefer. In magic spells, it might mean repeat this sentence again, but for the most part, it just means one more time. All right, that covers everything in chapters five and six. Next week, well, not week, but next lecture, 
we will be going through some example sentences from five and six to really hammer home the grammatical concepts we've been covering, specifically the infinitive.